above his name there is no other name the one who is eternally the same there is no other name the first and last beginning and the end he was the king who made the common man his friend there is no other name let every tongue proclaim and sing the name of jesus magnify and praise the name of jesus no other Jesus, Jesus, Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus. He created all that is with his own hand. And yet the smallest need he understands There is no other name The one who said, I am the great I am And then he gave himself the sacrifice for men There is no other name let every tongue proclaim and sing the name of Jesus. Magnify and praise the name of Jesus. No other name but Jesus. This power in the prayer. Name of Jesus, Jesus, whoever he shall reign as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and every living thing. From now on, we'll worship him and praise the name. Okay, wow. You want me to try to hit that note? That would be fun with it. <laughs>
I'll give you fair warning before I do so you can run for the door. Amen. Thank you, Amy. What a tremendous song this morning to just remind us who we're here to praise, right? Um, to lift his name up. So, so thankful that you're here this morning. Um, you'll notice in your bulletin that there's no children's church today. Uh, we don't ever have children's church on the first Sunday of the month. That we call family day. So our kiddos get to stay in here with us, uh, worship with us, get to hear Amy sing, right? Um, but anyway, uh, so kiddos are in here today, and um, so we're thankful for that. I uh, hope you're paying attention to all those announcements. We give Trey a heavy task to try to share with you all the things that are going on in the life of our church. And I will just tell you, church, gear up, um, because from now until Christmas, which, by the way, is 13 weeks away, is that scary? <laughs> yeah, it's here again, right? Um, from now until then, um, our schedule gets pretty hectic around here, lots of things going on. And it's all a blessing. We don't want you to miss any of it. Um, you'll be blessed as you pour into the lives of our kids, um, as you participate in many of the outreach events we'll be doing and things like that. Um, so we don't want you to miss that. And I appreciate so much Trey and Diane and Joyce um, trying to get some of that stuff kind of into your heads this morning so you know some of what's going on. Um, so we look forward to all of those opportunities that the Lord gives us to serve Him. But I'm glad you're here this morning, and I know that you're here to worship Him with us. Um, to hear his word and to let him speak to us. So I want to lead us um, one more time in a word of prayer before we open uh, his book together and, um, and hear what he has to say to us today. So uh, would you just bow with me for a word of prayer and um, let's just ask him to speak to our hearts this morning. So pray with me if you would. Father, we are blessed to get to be in this place this morning, um, to get to worship you. And God, we just declare before you, as we do every week, that you are worthy, worthy, worthy of our worship and our praise. You are worthy to be exalted in this place. And God, our meeting in this place today is not about us. It's not about what church we're sitting on, what name's on the door, what denomination this is, or even what style of music we sing. This is about you. God, we are in this place today to lift up your name, to worship you, and to hear from you. And God, I know that in a group like this, in a crowd like this, and we've got many others listening on our live stream this morning, that there can be lots of different things that cause us to tune in. Lots of different motives for us being here this morning. But God, you've got us here now. And God, more than we maybe even are aware of, we need to hear from you. We don't need to hear from the old ornery preacher standing in the pulpit this morning. We need to hear from you. We need you to speak to our hearts, to speak to our hurts, to speak to our needs. God, we are poor men crying out to a good God and a good Savior. And we need to hear from you. We need to know that you're real, that you care about what we're going through. God, we need to hear you this morning. So my prayer this morning, God, is that for the next little bit, you would help us to tune everything else out. Anything that would keep us from hearing you. And God, maybe like never before, give us ears to hear. God, soften our hearts so that it might receive what you want to say to us. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would have his perfect work in this place today. Nothing would hinder the movement of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way. And God, when we get ready to leave this service in a little bit and walk back out into the world and back into our lives, God, my prayer is that the things you've spoken in our heart today in this place might be life-changing out there for us. God, that this morning we just wouldn't, wouldn't just be stirred and, and moved by a, a service like this, a beautiful song like that. But God, we would be changed to your glory. God, we'd be ready to be your mouthpiece to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ to be your hands and your feet to minister to those who are hurting and to point them to you. God, we'd be the church that you've called us to be. 
not within four walls, but a church that's going and taking your gospel message to those who are hurting and broken. God, this morning I pray that you would speak loud and clear, Lord, and that we would not miss what you want to show us, what you want to do in us, and we would be changed by that to your glory. We'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be back in the Gospel of John. If you'd be finding the 11th chapter, um, John chapter 11, uh, that's where we're going to be today as we have been for the past several weeks. Um, you know, uh, someone once said that if you want to meet Jesus, you'll find him in the Gospel of John. Uh, that's a pretty good little quote, a pretty good statement, um, although I happen to believe that you can meet Jesus on just about every page of Scripture. There is some truth to that statement. Um, if you want to know who Jesus is, who he came, came to be, the claims that he made on his life, and the proofs that he is who he says he is, well, I would suggest the Gospel of John. And if you'll remember, several weeks ago, I challenged you to read the Gospel of John over the next several weeks, that for seven weeks, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. Well, this is week number five today. And so if you haven't done it yet, read through the Gospel of John, because if you want to get to know Jesus, you're going to meet him in the Gospel of John. As a matter of fact, John's Gospel says about itself that that's the reason it was written. John's Gospel is a little bit different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other Gospels. But John's Gospel says about itself, it was written that you would get to know who Jesus is, that you would meet him. And once you meet him, then the ball's in your court. What are you going to do with who he claims to be? What are you going to do with who he's proven himself to be in the Gospel of John? So if you want to know Jesus, if you want to know who he is, read the Gospel of John. Here's what John's Gospel says about itself at the very end of the book in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. This is very interesting. Just look at this passage. This tells you, John's telling you why the Gospel of John was written. Here's what it says. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in the Gospel of John. But these that are written were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, that's a great declaration for a book of the Bible, isn't it? He tells us flatly, specifically, why it was written. It was written so that we could know him. Now, we've been in the series of messages for some time now that we've been calling, who does Jesus say that he is? And that's a great question, right? As a matter of fact, we've been saying that could not be more of an important question. And I think one of the best places in Scripture to go to answer that question is the Gospel of John. Because John does something different in his Gospel. He gives us seven miraculous happenings, seven miracles. And each one of these seven miracles coincides with the claim of Jesus. Here's the seven miracles of Jesus. You may be familiar with these that appear in the Gospel of John. Sir, go ahead and put that slide up if you would, the seven miracles that you'll see up there of Jesus. Here they are. In one, very first part of John, he turns water into wine. Um, we're familiar with that. That's in the Gospel of John. In one of them, he heals a nobleman's son. And many people at this point are wondering, who is this man who turns water into wine and who heals the sick? But then it goes on. He heals a crippled man by the pool of Bethesda. And it gets even greater. Not only does he do that, right after that, he feeds 5,000, which by the way, only the men were counted. That means there was more like 15,000, maybe as many as 20,000, some commentary said, with nothing but a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And now people are going, wow, who is this man? And then Jesus walks on his water, on the water, to confirm to his disciples exactly who he is. Man walks on water and sinks. God in the flesh walks on water and walks on water, right? Amazing. Then he heals a blind man, gives a man that's been blind from birth his sight. And now many are going, could this be the one? Could this be the Messiah? Could this be God in the flesh? And then the one we're going to be at today is the last one. If all of that wasn't enough, and many are saying, who does Jesus claim to be? Who is he? And he's even asked the question, who do you say that I am, right? Then he raises the dead. He brings Lazarus back to life, and surely they say, 
this must be God come down. This must be God in the flesh. Now, those are the seven miracles that you'll find in the Gospel of John. And interestingly, in the Gospel of John, Jesus has a claim about who he is that coincides with all seven of these. There happen to be seven of those claims. We've looked at four of them. We're going to look at the fifth one today. If you remember, those claims are amazing because each one of those claims begins with the I am statement. Remember the name I am was the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when Moses said, who am I to tell people that you are? And God said, tell them that I am has sent you. And we looked at that and we realized that the name I am in Hebrew is the name Yahweh, the proper name of God. And when Jesus gave these seven claims of who he was, each one of them began with, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door, the entryway by which you must approach God. I, I, I am the good shepherd. I'm here to watch over you, protect you, I'm be with you whatever you go through. And today we're going to hear the fifth one that he's going to make. The truth of the matter is we got to do something with the claims of Jesus. The question to me may be beyond the title of this series, who do I say that Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? And who did he say that he is? The, the bigger question for me is, what are we going to do with the claims? What, what are we going to do with who Jesus says he is? Because he shows some miraculous events that he does, and he makes some claims about who he is. But i got to tell you this, it's not enough to know about Jesus. you got to know him, right? It's, it's not enough to know what the Bible says about Jesus or even to read about those miracles and try to form an opinion, an opinion about whether that really happened or not, right? It's not enough to know about him. you got to know him. And I love the Gospel of John because it helps us get to know him in a personal way. That's why it's written. You know, you can choose what you're going to do with the claims of Jesus. You can choose to ignore them or deny the claims or disbelieve them. I don't believe this ever really happened, but you need to know that um, you walk away from the claims of Jesus. Well, that has eternal ramifications. Walking away from the claims of who Jesus claims to do by doing nothing or denying them, that has ramifications for life here and now for certain. I believe that. But it has eternal ramifications. Or you can choose to listen to Jesus' claims. Study further about who he is, maybe in the Gospel of John. Dig into who he is. The choice is yours, but please understand that that's one of the most important questions in life you can ever ask. Who is Jesus to me? Who, who does he claim to be? And what am I going to do with those claims? Remember, we've been talking about this for several weeks now, and I've shared some different quotes with you. And Dr. John MacArthur, one of the preachers that I love to listen to, said, liar, lunatic, or Lord, those are the only options to consider when it comes to determining the truth about Christ. Some people want to call him a good moral leader, but if he lied in Scripture about who he was, he was not moral, and he wasn't a good leader. Sounds more like a politician, right? You get what I'm saying? That's not truth, so he can't call him a moral teacher if he lied. Or he was crazy, claiming that he was God in the flesh and the Messiah. He's either that, or he's nuts, or he is who he claimed to be. That's what John MacArthur said. Now, I've been sharing this statement with you every week, and I've kind of called this kind of the launching statement for this whole series that we've been in now for five weeks. But Dr. Paul Washer, another preacher, said this, and I've shared this one with you each week because I want you to think about this. He said that whether you want to believe me or not, I will tell you that according to the Scriptures, everything in your life, everything in eternity is determined by how you answer this question. Who do you say that he, Jesus, is? You have to answer that question. Who is he? Now, that's, that's pretty powerful and so on. Right? I've been sharing every week um, different polls and statistics. Seems like Jesus is a popular subject. Almost every polling agency and news agency seems to, from time to time, poll the American people on what they believe about Jesus. Well, about this time last year, a few months away from this, Newsweek put out a poll. Now, I've shared polls with you so far from the Barna Research Group and from Lifeway and from Legionnaire Ministries and all different types of ministries. Well, this one comes from a secular news source, Newsweek. 
Newsweek polled Americans on what they believed about Jesus. The poll was simply called, who is Jesus? Now, the answers, the responses they got were very interesting to me. This was polled last year in December, right before Christmas, which tell you why they got such a great result, right? I mean, it's that close to Jesus' birthday, we got to answer this one right, right? But this is what they found, and I find this quite interesting because we've been kind of asking, what do we believe about Jesus? Who is he? Who does he claim to be? This was a Newsweek poll. Reliable, not reliable, you can determine yourself, but that's interesting to me. This is what they found. I find this interesting. 93%, 93%, that's pretty high. 93% of Americans believe that Jesus actually lived. That, that's huge to me. That means, okay, then who was he, all right? If 93% say that Jesus actually lived, then who was he? Well, we've kind of talked about that. Some, some say he was a great moral teacher. and so, Some say that he was a prophet like other prophets that had come. Some say that he was a man of great integrity, the kindest man who ever lived, highly moral. We've read all of that kind of stuff. But, but there's at least 93 Americans say we, we believe he actually lived. Then this is interesting, 79% of Americans believe that Jesus was born of a virgin without a human father. Well, that's a miraculous event that 79%, according to Newsweek, believed. 82% of Americans believe that Jesus Christ was God or the Son of God. That's high, isn't it? I find that interesting. And then 52% of Americans believe that Jesus will return to earth someday, just like he promised in the Bible. And 15% of those said they believe he'll return in their lifetime. I find that interesting. And then 81% of Americans believe that there would be less kindness in the world if Jesus had never come. And then 72% believe that Jesus did indeed miraculously rise from the dead, just like the Bible teaches. And another 79% of Americans believe that Jesus was a great miracle worker and that the miracles he performed in the Bible actually happened. I find those statistics amazing, especially from a secular news source. I don't know about you. But it says to me, listen, we can believe all kinds of things about Jesus. We can believe he actually existed. We may even believe some of the claims that people make about him. But the question is, what have we done with that? What have we done with that claim? How has that impacted our life? How has it changed who we are, how we live? Has it adjusted anything in my life? If he's who he claims to be, listen, that has huge ramifications if that many people really believe he is who he claimed to be. I, I think we see here that many believe he was a miracle worker, that literally he performed miracles in scripture. Now this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 11, so hopefully you're there with me, and we've been marching through the gospel of John, kind of looking at each one of these things one at a time. We're going to be in this amazing story because as you walk through John, Jesus gives you these miraculous things, and along with that, Jesus says who he claims to be. He tells us, and each one of those claims has ramifications for our life. And ask the question, what are we going to do with that claim? How is that going to impact my life? What am I going to do with it? And we've got to say, listen, who does he claim to be? This is who he claims to be. Now, what are you going to do with it? So we're going to be in John chapter 11 today, digging into this a little bit deeper. And I want you to see this one because I think it's amazing. Now, I had a really hard time picking out what scriptures to read. I could read the whole chapter. But listen, that's a lot of reading, right? And it would take almost the whole time that I have to get through that. So I'm going to jump around in it. So you're going to need your Bible this morning. And I'm going to begin in the very first chapter, John chapter 11, because I want you to see the context of what's happening here when Jesus makes this fifth and amazing claim about who he is. Now, keep in your back of your mind, who does he say that he is? He's going to tell us who he says he is. And then the question is going to be, what am I going to do with that claim? Am I going to walk away from it? Am I going to ignore it? Am I going to embrace the claim, accept the claim, and allow who he claims to be impact my life? All right, here we go. Look at verse 1 of chapter 11, and let's read into, lean into this amazing, amazing story. Here's what happened. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary 
who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, and pay close attention to this, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now that's amazing. When I read verses five and six, I think those two verses seem a bit contradictory maybe, a a bit hard to take in. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he was sick, I didn't go to him. I stayed where I was for two more days. That a little strange sounding, but in verse told us why he's doing what he's doing so that Jesus could reveal to us who he was and be glorified. That's amazing. Now, as you continue reading, Lazarus dies in the next few verses. He dies. Two days pass, and we pick up the account in verse 17, and look at that with me if you want to read. I'll read on down to verse 27 this time, and let's pick it up. Now, Jesus didn't come. He tarried, even though he knew Lazarus was sick. Lazarus, whom he loved. And during that tarrying time, what happens? Lazarus dies. Now, look at verse 17. Here we go. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, where Jesus was, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the woman around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, oh, I know that. I I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And here's Jesus' claim in verse 25 and 26. Look at it. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever believes and li- whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. What a powerful in a tragic situation. I mean, many of you in this room have lost loved ones and your heart has been broken into by grief. You've you've experienced that. And into that situation steps Jesus in the moment of grief. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? It's because it's the first time in the claims of Jesus where he says to us, what are you going to do with this? You see it? It's the first time he said, I'm the good shepherd, but he didn't give an invitation and said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I'm the door. And we've talked about how we enter into need to enter into the door through him. But he didn't say, what are you going to do with that? I may have said it, but he didn't say it. When he said, I am the light of the world, he didn't say, are you going to turn the light on? He didn't say that. You see what I'm saying? But now he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? What are you going to do with the claims? Can you see what's happening in the Gospel of John? Jesus is revealing who he is. We're asking the question, who does Jesus say that he is? Who does he claim to be? He's showing us miracles. He's walking on water, and he's turning water into wine, and he's healing the sick and giving sight to the blind. And we're having to grapple with this. Who is this man? And he's claiming all along, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the, I'm the good shepherd. And now we get to this one, and it's make or break. I mean, it's life or death, right? It's where we live every single day. And he says, I am life, and I'm resurrection from the dead. What are you going to do with it? Do you believe this? Now, that's amazing, right? 
And what I want to know is that the story of Lazarus, written hundreds of years ago, one of the greatest miracles was that Jesus himself rose to the the dead. But not only that, he raised people from the dead. Lazarus, right? And we're told in verse 4, for his glory. What I want to know is how does this story that happened hundreds of years ago in Bethany, a little town outside of Jerusalem that was inconsequential, raised a man from the dead, what does that have to do with me here today, right now? What does this claim that Jesus is making now have to do with me? Well, let's lean into it and let's look at it. A little bit of time that I have. Let's kind of look at it and let's try to grasp who Jesus is telling us that he is. Because listen, I believe every word of this book, just like it's written, I do, or I wouldn't be up here preaching it. And I believe that it's just as relevant, just as applicable today as it was that Jesus told Lazarus to come forth out of the tomb. I believe it's just as relevant today. I believe that God's word claims about itself that when it goes out, it doesn't return void. I believe that, or I'd stop preaching it. I I believe that it's relevant for us, and I believe that this word is for us today. And he wants to say in our lives, what are you going to do with this claim? Do you believe this? So let's look at it. Let's pick it apart for just a minute, and I want to show you something. I'm just going to talk about this promise that Jesus makes in verses 25 and 26. It's a marvelous promise. And I want to talk about it and lean into it and understand this claim of Jesus and how it relates to us, what it says to us today. So let's take a look at it. First of all, if you're taking notes, jot this down. This will be on the screen. I want you to see this. This is so important to me. As the resurrection and the life, this claim that Jesus gives, Jesus Jesus gives us a promise that is powerful. This is a powerful promise. Don't miss that. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, listen to me, whoever you are sitting in this room today, he is speaking a powerful promise into your life based on who he is. And it is absolutely essential that you don't miss this promise because I'm going to tell you it has eternal eternal ramifications for you. It transcends this life. That's how powerful it is. So think about this. Here's the claim. Look at it in verses 25 and 26, and you just tell me that you can't see the promise here. Here's what he says. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And then notice this word, he who believes in me. Can I tell you what that he is? That's a gender neutral word. Although we read the word he, it means anybody whosoever, right? Anybody, anybody who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's a pretty huge claim. Now, now do you agree with me on this? If that claim is real, that's powerful. That means this claim transcends death. Now, 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 look what I'm showing you here. Now, so, somebody may say, now, now, wait a minute. H- how can that claim be true? I've known a lot of Christians who died. Oh, no, you haven't. No, you haven't. If you've known a Christian who has passed from this life to the next, he's just changed locations. She's just moved to a new place. Because the Apostle Paul tells us in God's inspired word that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we use the word died to indicate that something ceased, that it stopped. Well, you read scripture and you understand what Christianity, what scripture is teaching you and what Jesus is making in this claim. It's saying that if you are a believer who has eaten of the bread of life, that is you've taken Jesus life, right? and the light of the Lord is lighting your path, and you've walked through the door of Jesus, right? And you've entered into a personal relationship with the good shepherd that you will not die. You'll just change locations. You'll just move on to a new, better home. Boy, guys, I hope you understand this claim is huge. Do you get why Jesus said, do you believe this? What are you going to do with this claim? 
You can walk away from the claim and miss the promise. You see how important that is? Why that is so powerful? I, I, I love that. That's powerful. You know, throughout history, there have been tales about the legendary fountain of eternal life. Maybe you remember this. Legend had it that for one drink from the fountain of eternal life, you would live forever. You'd be forever young. You'd keep a youthful glow and you would never die. And that fountain was said to restore perfect health and vitality to whoever drank from it. By the 1500s, the fountain of eternal life had become legend. So popular, in fact, that one Spanish explorer, Juan Ponce de Leon, left everything he had in search for it. In the process, he discovered Florida. Aren't we glad? But he never discovered the fountain of youth. He spent his life searching for it. And the search for that goes on. Today, we're told that Americans will spend over half a million dollars every three years just to look younger. Isn't that amazing? In 2016, longtime fashionista Gloria Vanderbilt wrote a book with her famous son, Anderson Cooper. Did y'all know that? Wrote a book with her. And 1916. On the cover of the book is a picture of her with her son, Anderson Cooper. She is 93 years old, and she looks like she's 40. Perfectly pickled, right? <laughs> she was interviewed by the Telegraph, and the tra Telegraph said, Mrs. Vanderbilt, at 93, you look like you're 40 years old. She said, honey, I can't even tell you how many plastic surgeries I've had. And I've spent millions on every beauty supply to make you look younger than I could. Well, three years later, she died at 95. She looked 43, but she still died. The truth is I can give you lots of statistics up here and polls and surveys and all that kind of stuff, but there's one statistic I never get wrong. One out of one of us are going to face death. Every one of us. You know what the average life expectancy in 2023 is? I looked this up yesterday. You know what it is right now? 79. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but how many of you have outlived your warranty? <laughs> right? I mean, some of us are going, God is good. Right? <laughs> You know, some have estimated that at some point that that'll continue to climb. That's the highest it's ever been at 79. Many diseases now are being cured and people are living longer and healthier lives. And... But think about this. Even if we got the life expectancy up to 100, that's a drop in the bucket or less when compared to eternity. Get that. This is a powerful, powerful promise that he's making in this passage of scripture. I got to tell you something about this promise that makes it powerful to me. And I've lived through some of this stuff. This changes how we look at death. It changes how we look at hospital rooms, and nursing homes, and funeral homes. It changes how we view sickness. And doctors' diagnoses that scare us to death and terminal illnesses and hopeless situations. It changes how we look at cemeteries and graveyards. It gives us hope beyond the grave, doesn't it? That's what makes this claim of Jesus so powerful, so life-changing. Next time you drive past a cemetery, think of the one who that grave couldn't hold. And because it couldn't hold him, if you know the resurrection and the life, it can't hold you either. A little boy, five years old, was driving with his dad, and they happened to pass a cemetery, and they noticed a large pile of dirt, freshly dug grave. The little boy said, look, Dad, one got away. Can I give you a suggestion? Next time you drive past a cemetery, think about the one who got away for you. Think about the one that's the resurrection and the life. 
and then hear him say to you, do you believe this? You got to do something with the claim, right? Who he claims to be. Years ago, a Christian singer-songwriter, Evie, wrote this song, and I've heard this so many times, and I love it because it's asking us the question, what are you going to do with this claim? Here's what the song says. Anybody here want to live forever? Say, I do. Anybody here want to walk on golden streets? Say, I do. Anybody here sick and tired of living like you do? Anybody here want a home with God forever? Say, I do. You get it? This is a powerful promise. But here's the second thing. Get this down because this is this claim Jesus is making. It's a promise. I want you to see this. This is a prompt promise. As the resurrection and the life, Jesus gives us a promise that is prompt. And you go, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, it is on time promise. It's a punctual promise. It's a promise without delay. Now, now let me kind of couch it in these words, and I want you to look at this story and understand what's going on here, and I want you to get what we're getting from this promise. I, I want you to see this. I, I think this is very, very important. Do you ever get discouraged sometimes in your life? M maybe sometimes discouraged by God's delays, right? Many of us have been through that. We're God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers. They don't seem to be getting above the, above the ceiling, and we're discouraged. What, think about this. Don't answer this out loud, but what's discouraging right now to you? Discouragement has been defined as seeing things as they are without hope of any change. Seeing things as they are right now without hope of any change, I, I, I think that's just discouraging. And, and maybe hopeless. I see things as they are, and there's no hope of any change in that. You might be discouraged today because God isn't coming through for you when you think that he should have, right? Or maybe you're discouraged because life hasn't turned out like you expected and planned at some point in your life. Perhaps you're discouraged because you've prayed and you've waited, and then you've waited and prayed some more, and your longing of your heart, the yearning of your spirit just hasn't happened for you yet. Maybe you're discouraged because of a bad situation you're in. It could be all kinds of things. Listen again to the definition of discouragement. It's seeing things as they are without any hope of any change. This is never going to happen for me. I'm never going to see past this. I'll never get over this. The grief will never be gone, right? I'll never get through that. That's seeing things as they are without any hope of change. And I'm just going to tell you that when Jesus steps into your life, there is hope. Hope for change. The devil had a tool sell one time. And he laid out all of his tools to sell and laid them out in perfect fashion. If you looked at that, those tables covered in things, there was the tool of hatred and envy and jealousy and deceit and pride. But laying apart from all the other tools was a tool that was very badly beat up and it looked like it couldn't go for another use. It was so bad shape. But it had the highest price tag on it of all the other tools. Well, one curious buyer walked over to the table and began to ask questions. What is this tool? He asked the devil. The devil said, oh, that's discouragement. He said, well, why is this one priced so much higher than the others in such poor shape? He said, because with this tool, I can get into the heart of a man and cause him to lose all hope. And it's true. The devil still uses discouragement on us. But I'm going to tell you that Jesus steps into the most discouraging circumstances of life and gives us hope. That's what he does in the story. Now, I want to see this. Do you think Martha and Mary were a little discouraged here? They knew a man who had been walking on water. We saw it a while ago. They knew a man who turned water into wine who healed the nobleman's son, right? They, they knew a man who gave sight to the blind. They'd seen all that. They'd heard all that. They were close to him. They'd witnessed it. But when they needed Jesus, Jesus didn't come. He didn't show up. They told him, brother, sick. And they even said, he loved Lazarus. He'll come. But hours passed and he still wasn't there. And the scourgement's starting to mount. Then two hours, then three, and then one day passes and he's still not there. And then the unthinkable happens. Lazarus dies. And where's Jesus? He didn't hear my prayers. 
He's not listening. My heart's breaking. And where is my God? He has forsaken us. And interestingly, Jesus shows up after he's already been dead for four days. Now, if you think about that, you may read this passage with a little set of fresh eyes. It might begin to relate to you and me. Jesus comes and Mary stays home. She's hurt. Martha goes to see him. But her words to him are interesting in verse 21. Did you see it? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You can read that with any inflection that you want to in your voice, but I just have a feeling there may have been a little resentment there, maybe a little hurt, maybe a little anger. Maybe between the lines, and I'm not trying to add to Scripture, you might even heard, why didn't you come? You could have helped him like you did everybody else. Why weren't you there? I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but many of us have. And then a little bit later, Jesus has the same type of conversation with Mary. Look down at verse 32. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. It's the same thing, isn't it? Can I tell you something about God? God doesn't work on our timing. God is an on-time God. And as the one that is in in control of life and death, he is the resurrection and the life. He works on his time. That's interesting. We need to remember that God's timing is always prompt. Jesus didn't really delay in coming. We're told in verse 4 why he didn't come. That we might know who he is. Today, you know what? Aren't you glad Lazarus died? Because Lazarus died, you and I know the resurrection and the life. I mean, Jesus raised him back to death and I have a feeling Lazarus said what in the world are you doing do you know how good it was on the other side and I got to come back to this mess right Lazarus death was for a purpose and God's timing is always prompt and on time for his glory and our good if you back up to verse 4 you see it there this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. How is he going to be glorified through it? We were going to get the claim of who he is. We were going to see him for who he is, and it was going to make a difference. All right, I got to go into the last one because you guys know I'm going to run out of time. You got to see this final one. I got a few more things to say there, but we got to move. All right? This great promise that's found in this claim, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes me will never die. It carries with it this powerful promise for us today the hope of life beyond the grave, right? And it's an on-time promise. God's timing is always perfect. He knows what he's doing. He's prompt and he's an on-time God. He's never late. He's never early. He knows what he's doing. But third, I want you to see that this promise is probing. I've been saying it all through here. But if you look at our passage of Scripture in verses 25 and 26, look at it, you will see why I say this is probing because here's what Jesus said to them in verses 25 and 26. Pay attention to verse 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. There's that powerful, powerful promise. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And here's why this is probing because he says to us, do you believe this? Do you believe it? And I just have to tell you that that makes this passage relevant for today. He looks at us and he says, what are you going to do with this claim? Now, if you were to go back to verse 26, you can put your name instead of Martha's in there. He said to Buddy, do you believe this? Buddy, do you put your faith and your trust in what I'm telling you? Do you trust that what I'm saying to you? Do you believe that I have power over death? and life, and that whoever believes in me shall never die under any circumstances ever. You know, it's very interesting, this double negative that appears in verse 25. I think this is very powerful. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live, and whoever believes in me shall never die. You see that phrase, never die, right there? That's called a double negative. In the Hebrew, in the Greek language, it literally says this, he who believes in me shall never, no, never, under any circumstances, in any way, die. That's what it says. And that's what they heard. 
And then he said, probing, do you believe this? Guys, listen, that's powerful. And it's prompt, right? And it demands an answer from this. I love her answer, 27. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. That is a profession of the lips at who Jesus is. Now, here's what we have to do with the claim. Walk away from it and miss the promise that's probing to our life but prompt. Walk away from it and miss the hope of eternity and eternal life. Or grab hold of the claim, right? Take into our life the bread of life, who Jesus said he was. Embrace the light and the path that he has for us as the light of the world. Walk through the door, the passageway that he has made for us to be right with God. Ask the good shepherd to be our shepherd and embrace the claim just like Martha did. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask Nancy, if she would, to come and just begin to play our hymn of invitation. I love this invitation song, and we sing it ever so often. You'll recognize it right off when you hear it. It's a plea. That's how I see it. It's us asking the Spirit of the living God to fall fresh on me today. Fall fresh on me. Ask yourself right where you're sitting right now, what am I going to do with this claim? This claim is powerful. And it carries with it a question for me and you. Do you believe this? And if you believe it, what are you going to do with it? And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, you've never placed your faith in Him, you've never fully embraced that and said, I truly believe that He is who He claims to be. He's who He claims to be. I would never for anything in the world put you on the spot or embarrass you. I, that, that's not why I'm up here. I am up here proclaim, proclaiming the truth of God's Word at who He wants to be in your life and mine. He wants to be your resurrection and life. He wants to give you that hope that he gave to that family that day who thought he'd forgotten all about them. Well, he hadn't forgotten them and he hadn't forgotten you. And he's saying to you today, do you believe this? The Bible doesn't say you got to come to an altar and confess Christ. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you have to be with the preacher. You even have to be in a church. It says... Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That can happen right where you're sitting. It can happen in your car on the way home. It can happen in your home. It can happen in your office. But my friend, it needs to happen. If Jesus is who he claims to be, this is the greatest claim that's ever been made. He is the resurrection and the life. He's your hope for life now and your hope for life later. And right now, you can call on his name. And he can become your resurrection in life. But you've got to do something with the claim. Do you know him? And if you're a Christian today, will you just, when we sing this song a minute, sing it. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Take me back. Fill me with your spirit that I might be your mouthpiece to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is the resurrection and the life, that he brings hope to lives that are discouraged and broken. That may call for some recommitment of some lives. Some, maybe you need to come pray with one of our ministers or kneel at the altar just between you and him as a believer and say, God, I recommit myself to you, the resurrection and the life today. You see, I don't know what he's saying, but you got to do something with the claim. So in just a moment, we'll have a time of response, and we're going to worship and sing this song. If you need to respond, we're going to open the door for you to respond. If you just need to not sing and pray, you do that. If you need to just stand there and call upon the name of the Lord who saves and say, I don't understand everything there is to know about you. I still have many doubts and many questions. That's okay. There's a lot of Christians like that. 
but I heard him say, you are the resurrection and the life, and I believe it. And right now I call on you to be my Savior, my Lord. I believe in you. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, thank you that your word is direct, that it speaks, that it's powerful. And God, today we give you the glory and the praise for that and what you want to do in our lives. We worship you. And as we stand in just a moment to sing this song, we pray that the spirit of the living God would fall fresh on us in this place. Revive our hearts. Revive us. And if there's any in this place who need to respond to you in some way, God, we pray that you would give them the faith, the courage, whatever, to step out and respond to you by faith. Maybe right there in that pew or right here in the front. And God, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for what you do. It's all about you. So God, bless this time of response and may we be open to your voice. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Would you stand with us?